Yeah, computing global and very manifolds techniques and applications. So that was the title that I chose for the proceedings paper that you're then allowed to submit uh, in this four thick volumes. And so I try to convey more or less everything that I do, but that's too much to give in one talk. So, uh, so I have some pictures here, and I want to address a little bit about everything. So first is setting. Um, my work is mostly in the context of systems of ordinary differential equations. And so I really think in the form of vector flow. So I have first order differential equations. I have n of them. And uh, if you don't like n, think n is 3, because most of the pictures will be in three dimensions. Um, the vector field induces a flow. And I have all these definitions relative to what the dynamics is induced by this flow. So I have. For example, an equilibrium, right-hand side equal to zero. I have stable and unstable manifolds of this equilibrium. If the equilibrium is hyperbolic, all eigenvalues are off the imaginary axis. I can collect all the stable manifolds that lie to the left of the imaginary axis. The uh, total number, if that's k, I have a k-dimensional associated stable manifold. And that stable manifold will consist of all the points in space that converge to the equilibrium. That's a saddle that's unusual. And so their stable manifold theory tells you that there, there exists such a smooth object. Unstable manifolds, same idea, except that I go backward in time. And so if I have a vector field flow, I, have, I can reverse time. So that's all well defined. The picture that you see here is uh, actually of the Lorentz equations, in case you hadn't recognized it yet. So there are uh, three equilibria here, but the manifolds are drawn only for the origin in the, at the bottom. The origin is a saddle with two stable and one unstable eigenvalue. So I have a two-dimensional stable manifold and a one-dimensional unstable manifold. And so in my picture, stable manifolds are always blue and unstable manifolds are red. And so you see the red curve here that converges, if you want, or accumulates onto the chaotic attractor of the Lorentz equations. And I have this two-dimensional surface, which is the stable manifold of the origin. And so again, if I pick a point on the stable manifold, I will converge to the origin. I don't go to the uh, chaotic attractor. I just go to that equilibrium point. And similarly, if I take the unstable manifold, I go backward in time. Now you can see we have a vector field. This unstable manifold is one-dimensional. So essentially, that's a trajectory. And it's fairly easy to compute a one-dimensional manifold because all you need to do is find an approximate trajectory that represents that manifold. But for two-dimensional manifolds, it's already a real challenge. And this is a little bit of niche. There are certain groups in the world who do this and who are, I guess, becoming addicted to this. <laughs> it's really nice to try to get an even better picture of the stable manifold of the Lorentz equation. And so this uh, survey article here that appeared even on the cover is a way of presenting all different possible ideas that people have invented to compute a two-dimensional manifold using the Lorentz equations as the example. And uh, you might recognize some names in the list here. There are, uh, there's a group at Cornell that was really interested in doing this. Um, and so these are all different ways of trying to find an approximation of a two-dimensional manifold. So not necessarily of the Lorentz equations, just of an arbitrary system, usually in three dimensions, but the dimension of the system could be arbitrary as well. So the way that I've been sort of advocating as part of my research is using continuation of a two-point boundary value problem. And there are, um, well, maybe I should just go back moment, there's the geodesic level sets that fall under that category that uh, Ben Krauskopf and I developed. And then there's also this whole setup in a more general way uh, that was uh, introduced by Xavier Studio. And so we have started collaborating, the three of us, and we're using combinations of the two. Uh, so the whole setup is in the form of a two-point boundary value problem. So you have your vector field. I'm using the notation u now. I've rescaled time. And I always think of u as being an orbit segment that starts with time 0 and ends with time 1. And the actual time is then the capital T here. That will be the end time. 
And so it's an easy trick. You uh, formulate your vector field like so, and you can always think of having a two-point uh, boundary value problem set up where one endpoint is, is the condition where t is 0, and the other endpoint t is 1. Now, the whole setup of what I use is on one end, I restrict to a line, and on the other end, I restrict to a plane. If you want a nonlinear curve and a nonlinear surface, but it's one dimension on one side, two dimensions on the other. That's sort of the recipe. So you want to compute a two dimensional stable manifold? Well, you find your equilibrium. You find the eigenspace associated with the uh, stable eigenvalues. Then you're constructing your line, which in this case will be a closed curve in the stable eigenspace. That's just a linear approximation. If you're close enough to the equilibrium, we know that the real nonlinear two-dimensional manifold will be tangent to the eigenspace. So we can assume that that's a pretty good approximation of our manifold. And then we're looking for orbit segments that, I guess in this picture, uh, start on this line and end, well, for example, in some plane sigma. And if this is a stable manifold, the capital T will be negative. So you can do this thing as in terms of a plane, which would be an implicit definition of, say, in this particular case, typically you would say take the z-coordinate constant or something like that. But your two-dimensional plane could be defined in a more implicit way. For example, you could fix the integration time, that you just always have orbit segments with the same integration time. Or you have a fixed R plane. Or a very nice trick is a product of arc length and integration time fixed. And so these are different techniques that you can use to implicitly define such a plane where you want to end. And um, can be used for computing, for example, the stable manifold of the Lorentz equations. But that's not the only thing. So what we do when we have these boundary value problems is that my endpoint on the line is something that I see parameterized by one parameter. And so I really would like to find a family of solutions to my two-point boundary value problem. And that way I do, I, I, for that purpose, I use continuation. And the package that we use a lot is the package that Savius Doodle wrote, because we collaborated with Savius. It will be hard to convince Savius to do something else. Um, and that uses the solution set, set, set up formulated in the form of a piecewise polynomial approximation of the entire solution. And the continuation is done as a sort of variational problem along the entire orbit segment, which makes it very stable when you have sensitive dependence on initial conditions or you have very different time scales. Now, uh, ALTO, as some of you may know, is also, in some sense, part of the XPP software by Bart Dermontraut. And you can set up these boundary value problems in XPP as well, so you could use that code instead. There is a relatively later uh, uh, recent software called COCO that's developed by Frank Schiller and Harry Rankovic that runs on the MATLAB, as does MATCONT. MATCONT is, um, has very much focused on discrete time dynamical systems, but the ideas of uh, finding two point boundary value problems are uh, possible in, in the context of all these packages. So again, all the things that I show here are done in auto. Now, manifolds, yes, stable manifolds, unstable manifolds, but you can do a lot more with this setup. And so this slide gives an overview of how I apply these ideas. And so there's certainly the transition to chaos in the Lorentz system. Those of you who went to the Oliver Club talk last week, I really said, found some of that because Ben Kraskov gave a talk on all the things we do here, also in higher dimensions, not just for the Lorentz system. Um, you can apply it in the context of systems with multiple time scales. Um, there are several people here work with John Guckenheimer, or perhaps others who are interested in systems with multiple time scales. Think of slow manifolds. These are not invariant manifolds in the same sense as stable and unstable manifolds of an equilibrium or of a periodic orbit or something, but they are, um, you know, they can, they can be computed in a very similar setup. 
And so the uh, overall, these references are like the latest paper that gives you a good introduction into all the things that certainly I've worked on um, in, in the context of these computations. And so the sign review paper is a very nice one of uh, showing how these soul manifolds interact and give rise to mixed mode oscillations, for example. Now, more recently, I've gotten very interested in transient dynamics. How do you use dynamical systems in the context of finding transient behavior? Multiple timescale systems actually already fall a little bit in that category because you have the transient slow epoch that is followed by a fast transition when you have, for example, a mixed mode oscillation. And so if you want to explain what's happening in the small amplitude oscillation part of the mixed mode oscillation, then you're talking about, in some sense, a transient phenomenon. So there is also isochrones, for example. You have a periodic orbit. You're trying to find out if you give the system a perturbation, how does it return to that periodic orbit? Isochrones are a kind of manifold, so you can use invariant manifold computation to find isochrones and explain how the system behaves under perturbation. How does it return to the attractor? Intrinsic excitability is a similar setup. The system itself in this context is often silent. And uh, with Krasi Tsanova, who was also visiting last week, but she talked about something else, so that's not relevant. But uh, Krasi and I work on uh, models in neurobiology, and we're looking at bursting neurons, but these neurons only burst when they're coupled in a system. The, the neuron itself is silent unless you give it a uh, stimulus. And so if you're just interested in what the system is capable of, you give one perturbation, not a constant input, and then you see how the system relaxes back to equilibrium. And so again, the dynamical system analysis would just say, okay, there's an attracting equilibrium. Well, that's the boring bit. How do you go to this equilibrium if you give your system a perturbation? And what options do you have? A stronger perturbation, does that give you a different relaxation back or not? Phase resetting in that context is the same idea, so related to the excitability and also to the isochrons in some sense. And um, here's a slightly different context, a very recent application that I've gotten interested in, doing this in a non-autonomous system. So you have a equation that depends on time. And you can still use the same computational techniques in that context. So I want to focus on two examples. One is from the phase resetting angle, and one is from this non-autonomous systems. And so that's what I will discuss next. So let's begin with the phase resetting. So this is work that I did jointly with Dr. Sherman. And we are uh, interested in a particular type of neuron in your brain, in the hypothalamus of the brain. They're called pituitary neurons. This picture is a um, time series of an actual experiment of uh, the bursting of the so-called somatotroph cell. And so this cover of the Journal of Endocrinology gives a picture of these cells in some enhanced colored way. Uh, and so you have the cell soma, and these brownish granular thingies are uh, growth hormone that this somatotroph cell secretes. And the secretion process is known to be regulated by the kind of bursting pattern of the, of the neuron. And so the interest here is in seeing how this neuron, uh, is ex uh, how this neuron responds to a perturbation. And you should really think of this in the experimental setting. What can you do to this neuron? Well, you can give it an electrical current. And so you apply your current, and what you're observing then is some change in the phase. This is a bursting neuron, you give it a little kick, and then there might be a, a shift that the neuron bursts earlier than it would have without the perturbation or it, or it burst later. And so that's what this phase resetting is interesting, uh, is, uh, is all about. And um, I should have maybe mentioned that this time trace actually is uh, from the lab of uh, Richard Bertram and Joel Tabak. And their main interest in, there are different types of pituitary neurons. How can you tell, based on such a simple experimental protocol, what is actually happening? What kind of neuron do you have based on what you're seeing in the phase resetting? And so Arthur Sherman and I really studied this in the context of a somatotroph. 
cell, which is a very interesting model that, um, or a very interesting mathematical structure underlying this type of bursting. And so what you see is there is this, this sort of uh, area here, which is the plateau where the, the voltage potential is ramping up. And then you get a, an epoch of a, a series of short bursts, relatively small amplitude, but at a high voltage level. And um, after Sherman had other people uh, help with um, developing a very accurate mathematical model of this type of bursting. And so what you see here is a time series reproduced by a model of this type, Hodgkin Huxley style. You have voltage, you have two gating variables, and then you have calcium. And so the influx of calcium into the cell and then the release of calcium is organized, uh, organizes this uh, bursting here. And so as you are uh, bursting high, calcium comes into the cell, and as you reflex back, calcium is flushed out of the system again. Now this is a slow, fast time scale system. Actually, officially there are three time scales here. I have a very fast voltage, relatively fast gating variables, and very slow calcium behavior. And so the question now is, what happens if you would give this system a perturbation? And the, the main question was, what happens when you do this in the silent phase? You bring the system up to bursting. Because the, the, well, the, the, the experiments seem to indicate this is very hard. And you try to understand why. So the analysis here is very much in the style of uh, John Rensel. Actually, he presented that work at a much earlier ICM in 1986. And so from that paper, he showed that you can look at what happens in your system, how it is organized by effectively freezing the slow variable. So you take your calcium and you just pretend it's not changing at all. So when you do that, you're left with a three-dimensional fast subsystem and you're getting calcium-dependent families of equilibria, periodic orbits, and the like. And so in this particular model, we have a silent phase, which is a family of stable equilibria for low voltage. And we have an active phase, which you could think of as a family of equilibria with a high voltage value. And so these blue ones here are attractors. I also have a saddle equilibrium branch and there's a fault bifurcation here. So for low enough calcium, I don't have the silent phase at all. And for high enough calcium, there is a hop bifurcation that renders this stable branch unstable. And I have a family of periodic orbits that comes out of the hop bifurcation. Now this family of periodic orbits is not stable. It's a family of saddle periodic orbits. And that was very unusual. So this creates bursting, even though the upper state is an attracting equilibrium. So you would think that you're getting a relaxation oscillation, but what is happening is this type of pseudo plateau bursting, as Dr. Sherman called it, where there, there is bursting generated by repelling or saddle period orbits. So the actual bursting you can now explain just from this bifurcation diagram in calcium. So the overlaid orbit here is the same time trace I had on the earlier slide, but now I have it in the calcium V plane and I forget about time. And so the silent phase is tracking this lower state of equilibria because in this particular case, calcium is decreasing. I will track this equilibria until I get to the knee. Then I've lost my silent state. My trajectory will shoot up, find whatever the attractor is somewhere else. You can see the overshoot here. It starts the sort of oscillation towards this attracting equilibrium. But when now my voltage is much higher, calcium is increasing. And so I go past here, and as you see, even before I go unstable, I've gone through the family of repelling periodic orbits. I go out, jump back down, and the process repeats. So you can use this setup to investigate what the behavior of the system is. So can you also use it to investigate what happens if I give the system a kick? And so here, for example, if I were to set calcium equal to one, and wait until I'm in the silent phase, calcium one, boom, I give the system a kick. 
How does it relax back to this bursting orbit? What is happening to this system? Well, that's very easy. You need to give a kick to bring this. If you want to get the system to burst, you need to bring the system into the basin of attraction of that upper steady state. That should do the trick. So, OK, if I give a low uh, perturbation, not high enough here, then I will drop back immediately. So it should be strong enough to bring me into this state. But this picture is a little bit misleading. Because here I only show calcium and V. What I really need is look in my fast subsystem. I have a three-dimensional system. I also have these gating variables M and N. And so this lower equilibrium that I have for calcium equal one sits somewhere over here. And if I just go up, well, I don't find an equilibrium. The other equilibrium sits over to the right. And then there is this saddle equilibrium. That's this point here. And I have the family of periodic orbits. And for calcium equal one, that's this closed curve here. OK, so the question now is, how do I bring my system from this state, approximately, via perturbation, to the basin of attraction of that state? Well, the first thing, what is the basin of attraction? So what I did, or what I started with, was calculate the stable manifold of the equilibrium, the saddle equilibrium. And as you can see here in this animation, this saddle, this stable manifold will well, it appears to separate the space in two halves. The silent state is at the bottom, and the active state is at the top. But then it folds over. And actually, when you think about it, it is not really the separatrix. It's not the basin boundary of the basin of attraction. It is an excitability threshold. And so here, if I stop the animation and make my surface transparent, but I'm including the unstable manifold of this equilibrium, I see that the unstable manifold sort of that start goes below the surface straight away, goes straight to the equilibrium. Whereas if I go a little bit above the surface, I will make one large excursion before I go back to the equilibrium. But this clearly indicates that the stable manifold of the equilibrium is not a separatrix. Both sides, you go to the lower equilibrium state. So the actual basin of attraction of this equilibrium, as you probably already figured out, maybe, is the stable manifold of this periodic orbit. There's like a tube there. This periodic orbit is of saddle type. It has a two-dimensional stable manifold as well. And so here I've drawn it in. It is sort of the, I don't know, it's the, it's the carton tube that the carpet rolls up around. Right, so this is like a carpet, and it rolls up around that tube. That's a weird tube, a bit banana-shaped. So let's have a look at just this periodic orbit and its stable manifold. And so there are two views here. There's the whole thing here, well, computed up to a certain distance. And here I've chopped out a bit so we can look inside. And we see the attracting equilibrium here, now in white. And we have the lower state here. So I start at the lower state. I give the system a kick. I want to end up inside the tube. So the first thing you realize is you need to have a strong enough current, applied current. And so there is a bit of a, of a study here in trying to find the, a good value. But if I have a strong enough current, what I see here is I will move away from the equilibrium. This is no longer an equilibrium the moment I apply the current. And if I hold this applied current, I will start moving towards another attractor. Now this attractor, as it turns out, does not lie inside the basin of attraction of the actual upper state that I have when I don't apply the current. So while the current is on, I move away. But as I move away, I will pass through this basin, in this particular case, twice. And that's where the color changes to the cyan. There are two little segments here. And so I can see from this picture that I might have a chance, if I hold the current long enough, I might have a chance twice to be trapped by this basin of attraction of the upper state, and I will create a burst out of my perturbation. But it's tricky business. And so what I've shown here is using this theory of freezing the slow variable 
It's an approximation of what the real system does, but in this case it was actually successful that it really predicts or helps predict how the system is going to behave. And so we found that there are two cases where you have a chance of perturbing up in the, uh, in the, upper, in the bursting state. And, um, and so we're giving a very geometrical picture of what is going on, but at the same time you're giving um, you know, an experimental protocol on what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, there is uh, the actual strength and duration of the applied current comes out of this analysis. Does reasoning switch from current from voltage? We were talking about voltage before, and now you're talking about current. Okay, so voltage is one of my variables, and the current is, is the perturbation that I give. I'm applying a current which indeed changes the voltage. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry, I so wasn't... But the resistance is current, is, assumes constant or Ah, uh, yes. This is, this is, so this is a living cell, right. or yeah. assumed still alive, yeah. and then you're hitting it with an electrode, mm -hmm. and you just, yeah, it, it's okay. applying an electrical current. Okay. Yeah, that's what's happening. Okay. Yes? So, as a measurement of how hard it is to actually get captured in the basin of yes. the of the other one, you need to look at the ratio of the uh, duration of time you, you spend in the basin relative to the length of the trajectory after that. I'm suggesting uh, uh, the criteria